Okay, I'm going to do um, a, something kind of ambitious, and that is to entangle this uh, notion of little things with the origin of the late Stone Age, and focus as much on uh, uh, another metric dimension, which is thickness rather than length of things as being an important component of what makes um, microlithic microlithic. And I'm going to do this within the conceptual framework of what's called uh, the organization of technology, of lithic technology. This is uh, quite uh, well theorized and put into practice outside of Africa, but not in Africa. I began to touch on it in my paper called Small Things Forgotten in 2002. Um, and uh, it was as much about um, uh, social relationships as anything else, but I think the uh, organization of technology is very important. Okay, with that um, long-winded introduction, uh, what I'm really going to do is uh, talk about uh, technological organization and contrast uh, Middle Stone Age technologies, which I'll show uh, started out with large, flat, large blanks that are maintainable, resharpenable, they uh, are versatile and flexible, multi-purpose kinds of tools that are curated, have long life histories, retouch histories. Um, microlithic technologies, whether they're backed or not, whether they're large blades or small, uh, I'm going to um, take the position uh, that they're disposable, replaceable components. They don't get a lot of retouch post-shaping if they're large enough to have been shaped in the first place. Okay, so there's an example of a blade core on the left and a Labawa core, both from the surface of a site called Marmonet Drift, which we'll visit. Um, Ronan's been there already. And uh, uh, it's actually pretty hard to see that that's a, look, um, a nice little blade core. But those are quite different things. That big flake that came off of that core will have a lot of use potential, retouch potential, a life history. Little tiny bladelets that came off of the uh, prismatic core on the left will not. So I'm going to look at some of the earliest LSA in the Central Rift Valley in Kenya and in the southern, uh, southwest Kenya, uh, west of the Rift Valley. And uh, I want to talk about uh, what I think underlies this in the ecological and social dimensions, such as extended regional information sharing networks, which I think are characteristic of the last 70, 75,000 years, starting with the Hauizen's port. Um, and uh, the networks allow people to share information that can be used for planning and strategically planning toolkits, bringing the right tools for the job, uh, very effective ones, specialized ones, and the replacements. And I think this is what makes our microblade uh, even if they're macro blade technologies, um, uh, what they are. <clears throat> this is the region, um, Central Rift Valley, the upper larger red rectangle in southwest Kenya, the Intuka River area um, in uh, the smaller rectangle. And you can see up to Ethiopia and some important sites down into northern Tanzania. This is the Central Rift. We're going to visit uh, three sites. Um, one of them is uh, in Kapanea Muto Rock Shelter, which has fallen off the bottom, sorry. Uh, Dykin's Cliff, excavated by Lewis Leakey. It was a type site for the Magosian, and the Hawisen's port was once called the Magosian, uh, Kenya Magosian, um, and a site called Marmonet Drift. And we'll start with Marmonet Drift. There's about a 25 meter sequence of deposits there going back a quarter of a million years with several MSA levels. Um, near the middle and the top, there's a lot of unifacial, sometimes bifacial invasive, shallow retouch. And commensurate with this, there are <coughs> a lot of retouch flakes from soft hammer. These are soft hammer retouch flakes at the same scale as these bifaces at the, or unifaces with trimmed butts at the time they were discarded. This one was discarded at quite a large size because this half is basically a bubbly, rotten seam. This is finer obsidian. So the average size at discard was about four or five centimeters. But these are retouch flakes, 
soft hammer, lipped flakes, that came from when these things were quite large. And you can see a lot of use wear. Uh, SEM studies were done by Phil Slater to show that these artifacts had long life histories. <coughs> Lots of microware, especially on the ventral face. The other sides are retouched away repeatedly. And not only are they these large ones, there are hundreds and hundreds of smaller retouch flakes for resharpening. <coughs> these pieces on the right are more characteristic of the earlier MSA. Big denticulates with thick butts. Uh, this is a, uh, I'm not sure what to call it. It's uh, not a point, it's not an end scraper. Perhaps it's uh, not an end way way, but the other thing. It's a uh, tongati. Could be a tongati. And those two things on the bottom are really thick little chunky denticulates that have been retouched down to nothing. And we know they were once large because they have really thick cross sections and often large thick butts, um, talon. So um, that's enough about the uh, MSA proper. This is the rock shelter in Kapunei Amuto with a 5.4 meter sequence. And in the Pleistocene levels, that's the Holocene levels, uh, down here um, below the third volcanic ash right here, you'll see it, I'll show another image with a little bit better uh, it's all older than 35, uncorrected radiocarbon, 1,000 years. Um, <clears throat> that's the upper ash. We'll look at three lithic assemblages here. The Ndingi industry, it's um, final MSA or transitional LSA. Uh, the Nasampali and the Sakutiak industry. <clears throat> at the very base of the sequence, there are three backed pieces, uh, geometric I suppose, they're crescents. But uh, the thing to the right of it, as you can see, is a faceted platform flake with a urine scar, probably an impact fracture, lots of radio flaking. But there are um, bipolar pieces, uh, even batonets, the top there, um, <coughs> thick pieces, some radial, semi-radial cores, radial flaking again, a little bit of red ochre uh, on the butt of uh, that piece. So uh, we have an interesting mix. <clears throat> we go up to the next level. The um, entire assemblage with very few other pieces are large backed blades and they clearly are and you can see where red ochre was preserved on these, uh, some of them. And uh, the smallest pieces, uh, back pieces are about 27 millimeters, maybe 24. So they go up to nine and a half centimeters. Uh, they're very thin um, and they're very fragile. You can see the cross sections there. <coughs> um, here's some of the cores and a few of the other retouched pieces. There are hardly anything else but backed pieces, enormous numbers of them. We go to the 40 to 35,000 year old level. I call this the Sakutiak industry. Very few backed pieces and they're not, only a couple of them are geometric, um, highly casual. Um, that thing in the second row on the right is a big boat-tailed thumbnail scraper of sorts. But these are the real thumbnail scrapers. They're 33% of the assemblage. This assemblage has tens of thousands of tiny retouch flakes, probably from the resharpening of these scrapers. They're not the soft hammer, shallow angled, uh, lipped flakes. Even though there's a fair amount of bifacial or party bifacial thin flaked bits that you would call knives and there are a couple of disc-like things and a few regular cores. This is a funny assemblage because it occurs above something that has a lot of backing and very blady and thumbnail scrapers 35 to 40,000 years ago, uncorrected radiocarbon dates so, caused Hillary Deacon to just well, he didn't have any hair at the time he was looking at these things, but he was just going sputtering at the sight of these things. But, but, but. <laughs> um, so um, the highest frequencies of non-local raw materials are in the lowest layers. Uh, you can see the counts 63,575. That's mostly little tiny resharpening flakes. Um, this is the type site for the Magosian, Kenya Magosian of Lewis Leakey. It's 
called Dighton's Cliff. Uh, we did a small couple of test pits, one by twos, basically, underneath this volcanic ash that's dated 34,000 plus or minus four by argon argon dating. Um, and it's quite odd. This is a microlithic MSA, or microlithic MSA LSA, if you like, because top two pieces in the center are uh, fragments of backed pieces. The one on the left in the corner is really interesting because, just note the scale here, nothing in the site is bigger than five centimeters. <coughs> and um, it's kind of far away from all of the obsidian sources, and this might be important. But the piece up on the uh, top left corner I thought was a little tiny casually retouched point, but it's actually a soft hammer uniface trimming flake that's then been utilized. You can see that, that semicircle there is actually the platform, very thin. Uh, so I was surprised. And there are uh, buranoid cores, nucleiform burins, some bipolar pieces, and so forth. Uh, and these are some of the things. And remember the scale here. So the biggest piece here is about five centimeters. Um, so I've shown you macrolithic MSA, microlithic MSA, microlithic LSA, macrolithic LSA. Uh, What's a mother to do? And most of the obsidian here was coming all the way from Lake Naivasha, about 50 kilometers away from the archaeological site. <coughs> so this is the percentage uh, by chemical fingerprinting. And the second most common source is this one. Um, kind of an inverse distance decay. They were going for long distance things. And uh, so that's two examples of long distance transport at the MSA-LSA transition. Um, <clears throat> uh, if we go down to southwest Kenya, this is the Ntuka River Valley. Uh, this, I think it, we don't have a date on it, uh, very small obsidian points. The older MSA here is full of lava, big clunky lava flakes, uh, local, locally available raw material. This site goes up to 35% obsidian, and they're retouching things down to small size before they discard them. Only a few large knife-like pieces. That one's rhyolite. <coughs> We're 70 kilometers from the obsidian sources here. Um, there's only one backed piece in the section. Uh, this is another site further down the river, and it has the same lithic assemblage as the large blade assemblage the Nasampali one from um, uh, Nkapune Amuto rock shelter. And there's a few of the deep crescents, uh, backed blades, elongated blades, again with faceted platforms. Only a couple of little unifacial point-like things, but these are some of the obsidian backed blades and backed blade fragments. And there's the five centimeters for scale at the bottom. These things are really thin. They are really fragile. Uh, some of them, uh, I think it's this one, was encased in a carbonate nodule and it fragmented in situ uh, as the carbonate nodule stressed it. So these are quite big, but in the sense that they are fragile, they're not retouched after they're backed. They're used and discarded without further resharpening or reshaping. Uh, um, they share many of the characteristics of smaller backed industries. And there's some of the cores um, <coughs> and uh, some of the blades. Um, finding something whole, uh, a whole flake, impossible, uh, almost impossible. The last slide I want to show here is, uh, well, second to last. Um, this is called uh, Ntumot, means intersection. There are two streams that come together. Uh, this is a deep step trench. It goes about six meters from top to bottom. Um, there's another view. And at the other end of the trench, we did a little bit on the top. Uh, the other side of the outcrop and a big trench there. The top of the section is 30,000 years old. And um, in this layer, there were two LSA microblade assemblages with no backed pieces. And one of them was sort of a bipolar blade, and the other one was direct percussion blade industry. But 
uh, the average size of the blades is about one and a half to two centimeters. I'll show you what some of the stuff looks like. Well, well, we'll start with the bottom here. Below the lowest volcanic ash, it's about 63% obsidian, uh, to 60, 43 to 64% obsidian. Backed pieces and that are thin, most of them are broken, are sitting side by side in the same levels with uh, partially uh, bifacial, unifacial, very small points, some of which are smaller than the backed pieces from the same levels. So it's microlithic Lavalois, maybe. This one's very finely flaked. I'm trying to get them all to the same scale on these images. And there are very few of these very large things that probably had large use li long use lives uh, and a crescent from the same level. Um, these are the uppermost level that I pointed out that's 30,000. Uh, no retouched anything in this assemblage. And that's a centimeter. <clears throat> um, it's quite unusual. In between this and the first back pieces, which are older than 50,000 years old, there's about two and a half meters of small flakes. And it's a fairly rich assemblage. No bladelets, no blade cores, no retouched pieces, but lots and lots of little flakes. It reminds me of um, uh, Matupi the bottom of Matupi, which I haven't seen in person, but there really wasn't anything to illustrate there, was there? Yeah. <laughs> no. So that's, that's kind of unusual. Uh, this, if you only saw the bottom side of it, you would have thought that it was going to be a radial core, but you flip it over and it's a blade core. It may have had an earlier life history when it was a larger bit of a slab of obsidian as a radial core. So we have people in the same levels making back pieces, small points, and maybe at one point in the life history of a core making a, uh, a Lavawa-like flake and then later making a blade and using blades and point, uh, flakes uh, 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 contingently in different ways at the same time. Maybe even the same people, same person. The last site I want to show briefly is uh, like the 35 to 40,000 year old assemblage in Kapane Amuto uh, with ostrich eggshell beads, uh, faceted platform flakes, radial flaking, um, a couple of geometric back blades, thumbnail scrapers again, and uh, very few backed pieces. So we get younger, it gets more MSA-like um, I'm just not even going to talk about what happened after 30,000 years. It's just as complicated with uh, um, Gravettian-like assemblages in the Central Rift Valley being replaced uh, about 15,000 years ago by microblade assemblages without any retouch again. It's, um, it's a hell of a complicated place. Now, uh, the LSA, MSA-LSA transition down in Tuca uh, seems to go along with uh, an increase in the amounts of obsidian and perhaps chert. Um, between MIS uh, 4, 3, and 2 is the best we can do for dating. Um, and I want to um, ask some questions or pose some hypotheses about what's going on here. Um, Binford characterized the difference between the Mousterian and the Upper Paleolithic uh, as, and he also did this for sort of when he wrote his book on Classy's River Mouth. He talked about strategic planned use of culturally constructed environments. Uh, and Clive Gamble talked about um, integration of local hominid networks, a middle Paleolithic, uh, earlier kind of landscape and social organization into regional social landscapes. And the obsidian is monitoring this extended social landscape. <clears throat> um, I think this network of, uh, these networks of information sharing and exchange allowed people to make the planned toolkits to make the right tools for the job, which may be thinner, sharper, replaceable. Um, and I think this is all the information sharing was part of a risk reduction strategy like we see in the most severe environments 
where social networks are the most extensive in Australia, Kalahari, uh, the Great Basin, so the ecological context. I think what Lou was talking about is what I call the troop to tribe transition. Local territorial groups being uh, supplanted by those who had extended social networks across the landscape. And it's the planning uh, that allows you to take the right tools for the job. Uh, immediate information rather than relying on memory of what happened last year or five years ago. Uh, and when you know what you're going out for, because you've got current news. You don't have to bring so many of these large, flexible, contingent, um, versatile tools that can be resharpened for whatever. So uh, studying all these MSA and LSA assemblages, I see few shaped tools and lots of debitage, lots of useware. Um, my grad student Phil Slater did a nice microware study on this. When he got to the LSA stuff, he couldn't find any microware on anything uh, except the scrapers. He was quite frustrated. He said, well, as far as I can tell, they weren't used. But that's, that's a lot of microliths, backed pieces with nothing on them. So um, uh, this is all part of you know, uh, strategic technological organization. There may be other things going on here. Perhaps poison comes in. And uh, poison only requires a lightweight armature to be um, uh, effective. Uh, you can reduce the mass and thickness by taking two blade segments without the bulb of percussion. Uh, you only have to pierce something. So these two things are the same size. They've got about the same edge length. The only difference is that one's got a big fat bulb and platform. And um, uh, I think that this is uh, an important part of this. <coughs> now, I, I want to emphasize the ecological uh, setting in which these things first appeared, what may have been the prime mover or the kick, you know, the why and the when. If risky environments, as I, I suggested in uh, that paper I wrote in 1990 about uh, social and ecological models in um, Middle Stone Age of South Africa was important, and I had focused on marine isotope stage four, the early last glacial maximum. And in this ice core from 10,000 to 110,000 years old, you see the most persistently cold time in the late Pleistocene was 60 to 70,000 years ago. But it was preceded by this even colder period that lasted 1,800 years. That's when the Toba super eruption happened, and it was relentlessly cold for 1,800 years. That's a close-up of the oxygen isotope record. I call that the instant ice age. Toba didn't cause the instant ice age. It was already on its way. But I think after it struck, it became colder than almost any other time in the ice core record, and for longer. <clears throat> This is the kind of stress that Matt Grove, who will hear, perhaps not here at this conference, uh, just wrote about in QI, the kind of stressful environment that leads to strong selection. And from what we know from the ethnography of desert living people, strong selection for cooperation in severe environments. So this is my hypothesis for the kick. Now, when uh, Toba erupted 73,000, 880 plus or minus 320 years ago, uh, some of the ash blew all the way to Lake Malawi and to Pinnacle Point. It's found in the sand layer directly underneath the Hoesens Port. Uh, they don't want to call it Hoesens Port, but what's in a name? And uh, uh, the position of this backed blade industry at Pinnacle Point is exactly what I would have predicted had I known enough about climate in 1990. So I'm very happy that it came out 71, 72,000 years ago, because that instant ice age ended 72,000 years ago, uh, plus or minus a few weeks. Uh, so uh, in that sand layer that the ash occurs in is widespread along the South African coast, representing an abrupt drop in sea level. That was already on its way before the eruption happened. So. I like this data. So sorry about the blurriness of this, but 
This is a figure from my 1990 paper, and I suggested that um, first that the Harrison support was more on the high mobility information sharing kind of side of resource predictability, resource density, kinds of structures of resources across the environment. I think it was a less predictable, it was a more risky kind of environment that would have been a, a in which it would have been advantageous for sharing information to pool risk and uh, the fine grain raw materials that may have been part of an exchange system pop up at this time. So wherever the Hawisen support fits on this picture, it's certainly not down in the low res the high resource predictability, high resource abundant that we get in the early Holocene or through most parts of the later um, you know, the MIS-5 section where local lithic raw materials predominated. So, conclusions. Uh, some backed, indus backed blade industries are macrolithic, but they're thin. Some microblade industries lack backed artifacts. I think they share the property of thinness, replaceability, no post-manufacture retouch and resharpening. Um, they're replaced. You can't make a backed uh, uh, the edge opposite the backed edge any sharper than it was when you first made it. Um, and only in things like the ordination where the artifacts, the blades are very thick, do you get a lot of <coughs> tool transformation. Um, uh, and I think this all re reflects uh, a social environment that was designed to minimize risk by uh, information sharing. And along with that information comes the, avail the abundant raw materials, the fine grain raw materials, uh, and there's a, a dialectic there, you could say. So <clears throat> I think this was kicked off at the marine isotope stage 5-4 transition. And uh, I wish I dug it up in East Africa, but came out of South Africa uh, exactly what I would have predicted there. So I'll just say thank you to some of my uh, supporters and colleagues, uh, National Museums, Leakey Foundation, NSF, Kenya government, my university, and my colleagues um, and students, and uh, the people of Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, questions? I didn't load mine. And how do you define uh, macro versus microlithic? Ah, macrolithic is, I would say it's thick pieces that have long use lives, pieces with a long history, pieces that were big enough to be retouched many times over. That's a curated technology that you carry around when you don't know what exactly you're going to do during the day, but you know you're going to do something. And with the LSA, you're carrying around fragile blades that are thin and might need to be replaced. And they're cheap, easily replaceable. So MSA, LSA, doesn't matter. Macrolithic, microlithic, for me, it's disposable, replaceable versus curated. And, and in some here. senses, there are many LSA industries that are curated and not a lot of disposable replaceable. For example, that's the Kutiak industry with all the thumbnail scrapers. There are several examples of this at uh, Lukenia Hill as well. Very few backed microliths or blades of any kind. Um, but so it's, this sort of dissolves what really means to be LSA in a sense. If, if we assume this uh, definition, what do we do with um, those LSA, you want to call them that, as images that do have curated tools? Ah, well, like I said, we just have to use the labels with caution. The Albany, uh, Lockshook, Pomongwin, for example. Those <coughs> are people that we know from the studies at Mikey's River Cave. Uh, and upstream from Mikey's River, we know that they were not interacting with each other. We know they were using 
exclusively local lithic raw material. And we know that the 400, a large proportion of the 400 or so people buried in Mikey's River died violently or had a lot of evidence for interpersonal violence. That's not a regional network. And the stable isotopes of the skeletons show that the people buried at Mikey's River got most of their protein from seafood, and the people buried five or 10 kilometers upstream didn't eat any seafood. Those are lifetime averages of diet. So a lot of things fall together. But we also now know that the Halverson's spot in Southern Africa contains curated bifacial uh, points. How many? As many as Pinnacle Point has uh, back tools. Ah. Is that the case for all of the assemblages? It's Even within classes, I know there's quite a change in proportions throughout those meter or so of sediments, right? And there's also no reason why uh, uh, you can't have two faces to the same techno complex in terms of having a curated portion and something that is uh, 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 your, oh, yeah. the, the, the microlithic or the more modular, right? I know that during the ordination we got that. We got something that is very, very curated. Clearly, we have the movement of stuff on 300 kilometers of these scrapers, but we also have something, a production of very, very light bladelets, which is your disposable issue. So it's yeah. two different scales of it's the adaptation and mobility. It's emphasis, and it can change. And um, my original hypothesis about the difference between the why the Hawaiian support came and went had more to do with changing environmental contexts and the expansion and contraction of social networks. You can be self-reliant and go around with less uh, current information in a low-risk environment. You know you're going to find something. But if it's a really cold peak of the ice age, you may go around and find nothing. So it's best to have a lot of friends who might share information. So but now, uh, just to follow the, um, an experimental study that was done um, <coughs> six, seven years ago by Metin Aaron uh, and colleagues, uh, published in the Journal of Archaeological Science, showed that flakes have greater retouch potential than blades. Uh, so in terms of curation, uh, in terms of of techniques that should produce a more curatable assemblage. Uh, their studies have shown that you shouldn't try for a blade strategy, that you should be looking for a flake-based strategy. Absolutely. And if you want to have uh, artifacts that you can curate and use in a variety of ways. Yeah, it depends on what, what, doing what I artifacts. take from Aaron's study, which I think is one of the most important experimental studies ever done, is that if you start out with a large, thick flake, you can carry it around for a long time and do a lot with it without having to replace it. If you start out with a blade, you better know what you're going to do with it or at least bring replacements because you can't resharpen it often. And in his experiments, he used fairly large blades. Yeah. So what do you do when you're dealing with things that are uh, uh, two centimeters? You can't retouch them. Use once shape them once, throw them away. Um, Microware on microliths, back, little back blades is quite frustrating <coughs> compared to the success you get identifying microware, at least in uh, the study Phil Slater did um, uh, on um, uh, MSA. I think uh, what you highlighted about knowing what you're going to do with something is very, very important when we're talking about this curated versus non-curated thing because, yes, a flake that you can do anything with, sure, potentially can be more curated, but if you've got a blade that starts off this long, it's an end scraper from the beginning, and you find it 300 kilometers from the source this long, I think we can argue there that you're dealing with a blade technology that is highly curated. Yes. So I think... Uh, 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 we can't conflate something that is a um, uh, could be curated but multifunctional, and something that is curated but very, has a very very specific function. I think it's a little more complicated than that because these uh, blades, like the thumbnail scrapers, generate a huge amount of micro debitage, mm -hmm. well, uh, and so do um, unifacial and bifacial points that are resharpened. But back blades. You, you get the backing debitage once, and that's it. 
and only if it's a really thick back blade, like some of these ordination things, and a few, what was once called the Kenya ordination, you'll find occasionally they're made into earrings or end, scra end scrapers, um, are hardly ever transformed. Uh, those little thick, chunky denticulates that I showed that are almost as thick as they are wide, um, they're the last uh, gasp of a long, wide, very thick artifact. And Nick Toth showed with experiments with uh, butchers that when they were handed flakes to butcher with, the last bit of uh, sharp edge they got out of them was by the butchers actually flaking a few denticulate notches on them and then going for quite a bit longer in um, disarticulating these sides of ribs. So denticulates are a really good way of getting the last mile out of an artifact that you've carried around a long time. So, two completely different strategies of technological organization. I shave with something that I throw away. I don't resharpen my uh, razors. Um, but my Swiss Army knife, uh, I'm not throwing that away. That's, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with it every day, but I usually do it, do something. You'll take it to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost uh, at least two in the airport. That sounds like a recent experience. My fault. Yes. I was just going to say, in the, in the classification scheme of the NSA, yeah. NSA yeah. where do we then place those assemblages that, for example, Lars has pointed out, or, or others, uh, the Housen's put that have both disposable and curated <coughs> elements? If the curate, if disposable is an NSA phenomenon. I, I would say that the Howeisen's port has a predominance of uh, features that we associated with planned technologies, and that the Howeisen's port was the first where we see the extended social networks of communication and information sharing that would allow for planning. When you no longer need the planning, like in the early Holocene when they were shooting each other up, what happens to the lithic assemblage? It becomes the Albany. And as it dries up, uh, as um, uh, you can see in the uh, earlier to later Wilton, the classic Wilton is the driest part of the Holocene, the most classic, classic Wilton with the highest uh, frequencies of non-local lithic raw materials. Um, Tony showed that. All right, Tony. Um, What's his name? So Steve, you're proving me right. I forgot his name. <laughs> yeah. From Southwestern Cape. Tony Humphreys? Yes, I was going to say Humphreys, yeah. <laughs> Tony Humphreys uh, uh, showed the most classic part of the classic Wilton was the driest part of the Holocene. Right? It has been very famous. Yeah. We can, and again, this, uh, we'll move on to our last bit. We'll yes. come back to some of these discussions. And, uh, <coughs> Thank you.